Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the exhibit booths and the one-to-one -one networking. Um, thank you also, by the way, for all of the amazing comments and questions that are coming through the chat. Uh, the Twitter feed has been quite something to keep up with. So uh, thank you so much for all that you are contributing uh, to this event. Uh, so now it's my very great privilege to introduce to you our moderator for this next session, which, by the way, includes some of my favorite people in this space. Um, our moderator is a good friend of ours, Dr. Richard Graham. Richard is a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist and a former clinical director at the Tavistock Clinic in London. He is currently clinical lead for Good Thinking, London's digital mental well-being service. Uh, so, Richard, it's over to you. Thank you, Stephen, for, for such a kind and generous introduction. Um, it's great to be here, and even more so for myself, coming from a, a world of e-safety initially by digital resilience to now thinking much more about uh, well-being in the digital age. Um, we have a wonderful panel of people here today who will be introducing themselves shortly, but I think in the context of the pandemic that we've all been living through, there has perhaps never been a better time for us to be thinking about uh, digital well-being, psychological well-being, and our relationship with, with technology. So I think this is both timely and a wonderful opportunity to explore these issues. So I'm going to introduce the, the panel before we kick off the discussion. And perhaps uh, Nishina could come to you first. So um, could you tell us uh, something about yourself? Certainly. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I am uh, Nushina Minadine, um, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much to our organizers for letting me be a part of this with this fantastic panel. And Richard, good to see you again as well. Yeah. Um, I'm a clinical uh, pediatrician in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I also have a longtime interest in the effects of media on children and currently serve as the chair of the Council on Communications and Media for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I have been a practicing pediatrician for about 16 years now uh, and get to see pretty much everything um, front, uh, from, from a front row seat. So uh, I've been heavily invested in issues related to equity, inclusion, and diversity as well, um, since that reflects so much of my patient population. Um, and again, I'm very eager to be part of this panel. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nusheen. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Um, Rosalind, if we could come to you next. Hi, everyone. I feel like I probably I know so many people on the <laughs> other end of this. It's so, um, and I'm I actually right before I started this, I feel like I didn't ask her, but I, I'm going to do it. I was texting Dana Boyd um, right before this, being like, "Hey, I'm about to be on this thing." <laughs> so it's um, who actually moved um, to Boulder, Colorado, where I am. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I am running an organization called Cultures of Dignity, um, and we are working um, in schools, all different kinds of educational organizations, and with organizations in any capacity that are connected to young people, and therefore, hopefully, the well-being, emotional, psychological, physical well-being of young people. Um, and so for many, many years, I've been writing social emotional learning curriculum and parenting books, but for the last five years, I've really focused on what is it um, in the really granular ways um, that we can systemically create well-being for young people in the um, families and communities and, and um, educational institutions that they operate in? Um, and so I, you know, I've in preparation for this uh, for today, I um, talk to young people to get their um, input and to be able to share some of the comments and things that they are thinking about. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to hearing some of those shortly, Rosalind. Um, but finally, Tiffany, it'd um, be great to hear from you now. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. I love being involved with all things Fosse. Um, I My background is that um, I founded the Webby Awards in my 20s and spent a big portion of my life celebrating the vision of the web, the beauty of the web, the power of the web. But of course, like many of us around I know 12 years, well, for me personally, around 12 years ago, I felt like I couldn't complete a thought anymore. And um, my family and I started doing what we call uh, technology Shabbats, where we turn off all screens from Friday night to Saturday night. 
Um, we have done it for 12 years. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and for our kids who are now, we have a freshman in college and a 12 year old, um, but it continues to reveal how beneficial it is to reset <clears throat> every week in this ancient wisdom of a day of rest in our modern society. Um, so I ended up writing a book called 24-6 um, about all the neuroscience and psychology and just personal story of how it's affected us a couple years ago. And I do a lot of work in this space. I'm on the advisory board of Harvard's Digital Wellness Lab, um, Wait Until 8th Initiative, you know, multiple and Fosse. I love um, bringing us all together. So uh, I'm super interested in this conversation and it's an ongoing experiment that we're all living in and ongoing solutions to try to fix it. So I can't wait, wait to hear what you all have to say. Great, thank you very much, Tiffany. Right, so let's let's start the discussion then. Um, and I thought it might be helpful, and I don't know whether this is a, a, a big uh, pressure for you now, Nusheen, um, if we might want to start unpacking what well-being is and, and some of the sort of thinking around well-being and then we'll, we'll move on to resilience and how we may define that which is with which in its own way is also complex um so Nusheen, are there things about how we understand well-being offline that we can apply to the digital world and our engagement with technology oh absolutely well that's a wonderful question to start it all off with um <laughs> defining well-being and kind of looking at what we have in the offline world um to hopefully transfer to the online world so, you know, well-being to me is really a state of, you know, not not the absence of of you know difficulty or 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 distress, but really again the presence of being happy, being content, yeah. um, you know, feeling fulfilled. You know, well-being means so many different things. And when I think about my very young patient population, it's really you know having the ability to to be excited about things like you know one of the things i always ask kids when they come into clinic for 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 a check or a well child check as we call them here is you know what do you want to be when you grow up and what i'm really looking for is you know to hear what they're excited about um mm -hmm. and i also ask them what do you like most about you know second grade or what do you like most about ninth grade um and and it's sort of like it's it's a fairly revealing question because i want to know how they're doing i want to know what they're enjoying about what is happening right now. And obviously we have been for the last almost two years living in, in a really stressful, really difficult situation. So when I think about well-being, it's trying to encourage them to be able to think in ways that even when you're going through something difficult, um, you know, what, what are the positives there? And not just to be, you know, as we sometimes say, toxically optimistic, but to really kind of look at the substantial part of what is what is making me well? What is making me feel whole? And so, you know, the second part of your question, Richard, you know, looking at what can we take kind of from the offline world? You know, I think the, the, part of the difficulty, one of the many difficulties, unfortunately, of the pandemic is that so many of our support systems were, were cut mm -hmm. off um, as a result of, of social distancing or physical distancing, because we really don't want to call it social distancing. There are other ways to stay socially connected, um, but also, you know, missing kind of the physical activity, just the general togetherness that was so much a part of of everyone's life um, that we probably took for granted and so I think you know what did we learn from you know what what did we learn from the early days of the pandemic um, there are ways to stay connected I think human connection has really become more important than ever before and we're fortunate that now we have technology that allows us to stay connected I mean when we think about if this pandemic had happened 30 years ago would we have been able to connect in the way that we are now Probably not as easily. I mean, we had telephones then, um, and 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 being someone who grew up in that era, uh, obviously, I know how I was able to stay connected with people, but not in in a large way. So, I think really to kind of sum up, I think well being is really the presence and uh, the ability to to find you know that goodness, that happiness in 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 whatever situation you're in, and yeah. also I think human connectedness plays uh, plays a big role. Thank you, Nusheen. That's a really great introduction. Rosalind, I was thinking with all the wonderful work you're doing with young people, I guess they are sharing with you the opportunities, the benefits, as well as some of the downsides of, of tech. I mean, are there things that you're hearing from these conversations with young people about, particularly during the pandemic, perhaps, how technology may, may have helped their well-being? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... So in the beginning, and I think we all saw this, that young people were reporting to me that they were really grateful to get the time to decompress 
and that they the schedule in the first March and April of 2020, there was a lot of, wow, I'm actually really, it's really good for me to be like not rushing to every sports practice that my parents are making me go to and then having to do this and this and this and this and this. There was a lot of, of um, really surprised from young people of like, wow, I really needed to be disconnected from all of the things that parents, you know, well, certain, of course, socioeconomic classes were pushing kids to do. Um, and, and young people were conflicted about that and oftentimes didn't know how to talk to their parents about it because it would come across as um, that they wanted to quit something and parents are very focused on, and for understandable reasons, going through, coming through with your commitments. And yet young people were exhausted oftentimes about keeping up with those commitments. So there was a real sense of that in the beginning. And then as of course things went through and continued, there was a real sense from young people that I was talking to, except for there was a, a minority who felt better um, being introverted and being away from school or if school was really dangerous for them or unsafe and it felt better to be and home was safe, they felt better being at home. Um, but for the majority, of course, of young people, there was really a sense of um, extraordinary loneliness and mm. also of anxiety about how to continue maintaining the friendships that were so were and are so incredibly important to them, which is impacted, by the way, now that they're back in school, the amount of um, anxiety and the amount of reactivity and the amount of just um, reverberation of social dynamics that are happening in schools right now. Um, most of the principals I work with um, are reporting um, the highest level of disciplinary infractions and things that they have to do um, that they've ever done before. That's an unusual. Um, so, in, and then I wanted to go back to something that Nusheen said because this definition of happiness I think is really important and I think it connects um, Richard for just sort of everything that we're talking about yep. is that for me happiness and the way that I talk about it with young people is that I define it in five, with sort of five criteria. One is curiosity, having something you're curious about. The other is having a sense of purpose, like meaning beyond mm -hmm. oneself. What, the next is having meaningful social connections. So that allows me to differentiate between um, meaningful social, social connection on tech, through technology and then um, connection that is that actually hurts them and makes them feel insecure and makes them feel um, you know, that they're trying to keep up and, and not feeling good about things. Um, that there is a, the fourth one is a hope of success, not a guarantee. And the fifth is that you have a place to, um, uh, to find peace and a place to, to a place to feel peace and a, and a place to process like your day. And if we have those five, if we are, if we have those five things in our head about what happiness can be, then we can have a framing for how to weather um, the inevitable frustrations, conflicts, difficulties, and emotions that we feel. Um, because as I say to young people constantly, emotions are real, they are super real, they don't necessarily have to be permanent. Thank you, and a great way of unpacking further uh, what well-being might be, which I often compare with, say, like physical fitness. It's something one can work at, and you can improve your well-being as you can your, your, your physical health. But if we move, Tiffany, to your um, thinking that also well-being might be connected with being able to regulate the amount of um, mm -hmm. screen time or your screen life balance and, and the breaks from the technology as well with the digital Shabbat can also be a contributor to good well-being. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, I really enjoyed hearing those definitions, but I do think I, I'll move it to what I notice in myself and my children and my husband when we unplug is that the online world seems to create this state of wanting more, wanting that next text notification, the thing you're not at, mm. the game, the, the, you know, you're just in a constant state of want and that when we turn off the screens on Friday night, it's this amazing thing that happens where you look at what's right in front of you. And I, I feel a sense of like gratitude for what's right in front of me in our home. You know, we always have people over Friday night or even just being by yourself. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting component is well-being with yourself. And mm -hmm. I think that these, um, yes, what would we have done in the pandemic without the web? And obviously I love technology and 
all the scientists came together, somebody for vaccines. There's so many benefits, but I think that teaching children um, how to be comfortable to be with their, themselves and mm-hmm. to value that and to be okay with that. And even when it's uncomfortable and they might be bored and like, I mean, what I've found is whenever that state happens, they will then get really curious and do something really creative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to like have them sit through that <clears throat> uncomfortability and well-being is like a, a, an ability to be in the world, both online and in the real world. Yeah. And I wanted to add a, a nature component because I think um, when we think of digital well-being, um, and just well-being in general, um, being outside and being in the natural rhythms of nature and it's so important. And those usually happen for our family on the Saturday when we're unplugged because no one's trying to get each other off the device or whatever that is. Um, so I feel like the well being, what I feel like COVID really did for our family is really a reminder of how critical that kind of natural rhythm of nature and just natural rhythm of sleeping and not being overextended. And um, so I think, and, and also understanding how critical um, being physically together is that as much as it's really interesting to think about the tech that obviously it accelerated technology in schools in this kind of incredible way that needed to happen for students with disabilities or for a million reasons. Um, and even we had like, you know, snow days, they can still go to school. I'm sure the kids don't like that, but um, <laughs> or rain days as we had it over here in Northern California recently, but understanding what technology can replace and what it can't. And I loved that moment at like, after like four hours, you know, I'm sorry, four months of the pandemic and the kids just wanted to get off the screens and be with each other. And like, I, there was a, like, you only understand something, the value of something when you don't have it. And I find that that happens each week with the tech Shabbat also. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and sort of move us on a little bit now to something that, and it feels a bit chicken and eggish to me as to what is a component of the other, like um, is resilience an aspect of well-being, or is well-being a sort of product of, of uh, developing resilience? But um, again, I mean, perhaps unfair, Nusheen, to give you the the opening one. I mean. When we're talking about resilience, I mean, there are so many definitions. One of my favorite ones is an old watch advertisement. I think about Timex watches called, um, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Um, (laughs) But um, resilience is, again, one of those aspects that has sustained people through the pandemic. Um, What sort of thoughts do you have about how we understand resilience and how we might sort of help people develop it? So that is so interesting. I, I do remember that time exit as soon as you <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I have this picture in my mind. So so it's interesting. Like I, I think my understanding of resilience has evolved, maybe particularly over the last decade or so, because I also used to think of it in terms of resilience is yes, you get, you know, pushed down and you get back up again. You know, no matter what happens, you're constantly getting up again. And you know, I mentioned earlier that I, you know, I, I have a strong working interest in equity. And what's interesting to me is like, you know, as we talk about, you know, different things from an equity lens, when I think about resilience and you know, also being a healthcare worker during this time, um, you know, we're always told to be resilient. And, you know, we're supposedly, you know, chosen, I guess, to to be able to do these things, because we're able to see sometimes the worst things happen to people, and then like, literally the next minute have to go and be fully on again for for our next patient. And, you know, I and, and so I've really started to, you know, to reconsider that. And is that truly resilience? Or is that just, um, you know, sort of pushing through and I don't know what a toll what sort of toll that takes on us over time and I think especially over the last couple of years with um, with not just the pandemic but you know other other things happening in the world we have really started to think that maybe asking people to just get up again after after every push down is not necessarily healthy for them and so I, and I think Rosalind you'd mentioned early on that you're, you're thinking in systemic ways and so when I think about resilience I also think about you know what can we do systemically for for for, for for our youth, you know, a, is it really fair to sort of say, nope, you've got to be beaten down, and and after you're beaten down and you prove that you can get up again, that shows that you're resilient and you're strong, or do we really need to try to redesign a system that is more 
I don't know, for lack of a better term, user friendly, that that's just more humane um, for, for everyone. You know, I don't think it's just, you know, kids or just teenagers who are facing this. It's definitely adults. I mean, I'm seeing yeah. so much stress around me. So it's interesting. Like I, you know, I, I think I've evolved and I don't know that I have a good answer for you, but I think resilience has to be something that's not just proving how tough you are, um, but really working on, again, having the presence of positive and healthy and humane systems that support people. Um, and, you know, I think about, you know, people who are especially from under-resourced populations or marginalized yeah. populations who have to face this all the time. It's not healthy to constantly being, to, you know, to constantly be, be put down. That's not, that's not a healthy way to live. So I'm, I'm eager to hear what everyone else has to say. Mm. Well, thank you. Um, and I was thinking, Rosalind, I mean, it, it, some of what Nusheen was saying to me that some of us have been able to continue through the pandemic because our values and what we feel is important really sustain us at times when uh, we're stretched almost to breaking point and, and there is no infinitely resilient material as I understand it. But you were talking, I think, about the head teacher, I think he was talking about a greater number of disciplinary sort of um, moments that might align quite well with what Nishim was saying about, you know, there is stuff still to process. And I think you brought that up very powerfully as well. And is being resilient also knowing how to, to process and seek help and, and show self-compassion, I guess, at times. I have a few, yeah. So <laughs> there are so many <laughs> going to choose what to, what of the many things. So, um, I think one of the most important things we need to think about with resilience is, especially from what Nishin just said, and I really agree with, is that resilience and the ability to face adversity and learn from it really only happen, really for the most part happens in very much with what Nishin's talking about with the support of the right people behind you. And um, I think one of the things that we don't do, there's a couple of things that we need to do a lot better as adults. Number one is, is that we need to acknowledge the messiness of the educational system and the, the um, not having young, not being able to give young people a voice in a constructive way with guardrails about how to have difficult conversations. And I think one of the things that we are seeing today is that young people are trying to figure out for very good reasons how to address the systemic inequities and hypocrisy that they are seeing. And we have not given them um, the, the strategies and skills of understanding how our brain works with emotions, about understanding emotional regulation, about understanding how that connects to critical thinking, about how to then have those conversations. Um, we have not done that. Um, and I'm very, very concerned that we that what's happening politically in the country is that there will be even more um, stopping of trying to give young people the emotion, social and emotional skills that they have to have to be able to manage themselves um, when they are trying to have and address issues that are really important to them. So, um, and, so and then we and then what happens is that as adu with adults is that we see what they're doing and if we don't like it, um, then we tend to either ridicule it, dismiss it, or in some way dominate yeah. it. Yeah. And so that's and then that gets to very much to the equity issues I think, Machine, that you might be referencing. So, um, so here I'm gonna you know I'm gonna say and I think this is a, you know something that I would love for us in this community to tackle, but it's gonna be uncomfortable. Um, but I, I don't think we're gonna get young people to take us collectively seriously unless we are willing to acknowledge the, the hypocrisies that they have been dealt with. Yeah. And that they need to, we need to be able to reach out to young people collectively, strategically, thoughtfully, where we acknowledge that we have given them a tool that has also really hurt them in some ways and that some of these tools have been really hurtful to their mental health and that adults were the people that gave them those tools mm -hmm. and that is a really uncomfortable thing for all of us to be thinking about but if we don't have these conversations with young people where we acknowledge what we collectively and sometimes specifically have done to impact their mental health they are not going to believe what we are talking to them about. And they are not going to come forward. And, and frankly, the good, you know, why, why would they? 
So this, and this directly contributes to that, not only their mental health and, and physical health and emotional health, but it contributes to the entire community, to us, because we have young people coming through who are disengaging from and not believing mm -hmm. that there are people in the world systemically that care about them more than making money. And that's mm -hmm. a really important thing for us to be able to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's uncomfortable, but that's our responsibility as adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, a, a, another powerful sort of perspective there that acknowledging kind of how things are might actually, and, and feeling heard, I guess, feeling you have a voice is so important in someone feeling, and going back to your first point of what sort of future you might have, Nasheen. Tiffany, I guess this is where sometimes a break from some of those environments, again, I feel like I, I'm giving you... Um, sort of rather too much about sort of the value of the, the Shabbat and the breaks and those spaces for creativity. But you know, Rosalind's speaking very powerfully about putting mm. things in the hands of young people that could be part of the problem. How, how do you think about resilience from this sort of experience of, of time away from the tech? Yeah, um, I mean, I think one of the things that the pandemic really um, underscored was adapt the need for adaptability and flexibility, which I think are tied to resilience. And when you get new information to kind of rethink what that means in a larger context. And I think one of the biggest problems, even for me personally, like I run towards my Saturday, the thinking I have in on Saturday, because I feel like I lose perspective. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm so in the network as our kids are. And then on Friday night when I detach, and then usually Saturday is much more of an open day to think, I feel like that's the day I get perspective back. And I think that we lose so much perspective by being online all the time. And, and most people don't even know what it's like to go off of it. And I think that that is hopefully, um, you know, and I'm sure anybody that's their kids have been either on a trip or camping. And it's just like, it really wakes you up in this whole different way that you, you know, feel um, that you need the, that muscle, just like anything, like what we're talking about is developing a muscle to um, deal with your own emotions. I think what happens is online, it's such a reactive state of being. And, you know, when you're offline, you still have all your emotions and those are real, but it's like, how do you negotiate with them um, without just being in a constant state of reaction? But, you know, one thing that I wanted to bring up and I would just love to hear what people think about it is the whole, the Facebook story. And, and I was so curious how the youth were hearing that story or if they were hearing that story. Because I worked on this film once, uh, I do something called Character Day, which deals with like kind of positive psychology for kids in schools and, and companies. We made this one film called Dear Parent and one called Dear Student. And we were talking to Angela Duckworth about, you know, how to frame it to the kids so they will hear it. And, and what she talked about is if they think they're being duped or they're being taken advantage of, you know, that that might wake them up. So here this Facebook story happens and I was like, so are kids talking about it? Or, you know, no. <laughs> it was like a fascinating thing. I even talked to my college freshman daughter. I was like, are you guys all talking? You know, she's like, it's really not being talked about. And so here, all the parents and all the adults were like, finally, what we all knew to be true is documented in these papers. But I, like, how do we present that information in a way that just like, Rosalind, what you were saying is like, that is very honest with the kids, but so also they'll care. Like what is the right way to communicate this incredibly important information that doesn't seem to be registering with young people? I, or I don't know if you all find anything differently, but I found like kind of a radio silence from the younger people about that issue. It's, a, it's such an important point, isn't it? And, and I wonder whether part of the challenge there is, is that um, we perhaps expect quite simplistic sort of discussions around harm versus no harm. Um, I found myself, and I, I, I think it'd be great to hear from you all on this, kind of thinking about what it would be like talking to young people about whether to live in a city or not. I mean, there's lots of research evidence about access to green or blue spaces being great for your well-being, mm -hmm. but would you want to live in the country? Um, so, so um, Nishi, what, what's happening with young people, do you think, around some of these revelations about 
potential harms to themselves. Are we getting that conversation right yet? Are we engaging them in a, uh, a more detailed sort of interrogation, really, of what, what is happening for them? So that's an interesting thing, because like I haven't spoken specifically to young people about the Facebook issue, although I would love to hear more about it if we had focus groups. Um, it's interesting, though, as, as you were talking, Tiffany, I was thinking about how I think that, you know, and, and, and I completely agree with Rosalind on this. I think that young people have a very strong hypocrisy detector and, yeah, yeah. and, and they know know uh, when when they're kind of being used or when they're being talked down to. But at the same time, as, as you were saying this, Tiffany, I was thinking about how so many young people kind of accept certain things as just a part of daily life. And I think yeah. about how this generation, and, and, and this is, you know, a more extreme example, has literally grown up with active shooter drills. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean that they say, okay, we're not going to go to school anymore. They're just like, well, this is part of the thing, which is horribly sad in, in multiple different ways. But, but I think they just sort of accept that they live in this world where people are going to try to profit off them and well if you know facebook or or whatever social media thing is something that's necessary for them to connect with other people or you know to stay on top of things then i think they maybe just know that but they accept it as a necessary evil that's my take on it mm. yeah i mean rosalind again in your discussions with young people do they see even the adult discussions about the facebook research as another hypocritical moment really that isn't really about addressing the real issues as Nashim was talking where there are you know, shooter drills and so on. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think that the hope that I always have is that when we speak honestly to young people about the complexities of our world, that they take us much more seriously. And, um, and that you know, we real, but that that makes adults really uncomfortable because it acknowledges, um, yeah. you know, so many things that we don't want to do. <laughs> so, um, but the sad, the you know, so for me, it has always been a place of hope that when we are honest with um, that, they come forward to us. Um, and you know, I really would think about how I mean, I'm looking at my phone because I asked um, some teenagers to, in preparation for being with you all today, I asked them to give me some feedback. And one of them said, you know, I honestly don't know how to create a healthy balance. Um, I do think there's some pros to technology, but there are so many negatives. However, I find that adults often come in it the wrong way. There's so much discussion over how technology is changing our relationships with others, but we don't, they don't talk about it with us in the right way. And then she goes later to say, the, mo the thing that I found, this is a 17 year old girl. She said, the thing that I found to be the most helpful for me is the TED talk, which she then gives me the link to, of um, the really interesting about market, how the marketing behind social media and how it gets us to spend as much time on social media as we can. I think it's really good for us to understand how we are pressured to be on our phones and the sort of, and the physiology behind it. And so and I, that's what I have found is that I have found a, big, a lot of young people who want to talk to me about, um, you know, that, and also an affirmation of, I am not crazy and I am not insecure and I am not addicted to my phone just because I'm addicted to my phone, which is one of the things that parents will say to their children all the time as if it's sort of the kid's fault or there's like a weakness mm -hmm. or there's like, some, I think, you know, you're addicted to your phone puts it on the kid. And so when I have the young person, and so what I have found is that when young people are given the information of why they are being so drawn to that and what are the mechanisms that's making them do that, one of the things I actually had a young person, a group of boys who are high school said to me is, you know, it would be super helpful for us. And then they did this. Um, we did this during a Zoom call during the last year is they said, let's all pick up, let's all look at our pickup rates of how many times during the day we have picked up our phone. And then we mm -hmm. compared it, I had to do it too. And, um, and then we talked about that. And so the experience, my experience is, is that they do want to talk about it and they want to talk about it in terms of there's a reason why I am having such a hard time putting the phone down having, and my parents can talk to me about it and they can do all sorts of things, but can we please acknowledge that what is coming at me is too powerful for me? Mm -hmm. And, and so can we please just acknowledge this instead of saying you are addicted to your phone? And I think, and so being able to say why we are, and also for young people to be educated about that, um, 
I think gives them the respect that they are looking for yeah. that to say, yeah, I'm there, you know, it, it feels like we are respecting the world in which they are living. And when we do that, young people really come forward. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's what I experience with young people on a consistent basis across the board. Yeah. Well, even I um, want just one follow on to that is that what I found, I mean, this is with parenting, but just adulting is so much about modeling behavior. You can say something 3000 times, but it's what they're watching you do. So if you're like, oh, you got to get off, you got to get off your phone, got to get off your phone and you're on your phone. What are they seeing that you're on your phone? And parents are just addicted. Adults are just as addicted as their kids. So we're saying this one thing and then doing one thing, which is why this one day a week where we're all in the same boat, no one has, no one's got this up and not looking around. It has this effect of just like, you know, mat modeling. And, um, and to your point, Rosalind, I will say sometimes, oh my gosh, I'm putting the phone downstairs before bed because I just can't stop looking at it. And verbally say your own addiction problems that are from thousands of scientists and engineers and corporate executives that want to keep you glued to the screen and that unpacking that is really important and you have to send us all that ted link so we can have it <laughs> what, what she told me absolutely <laughs> It's um, Tristan Harris's. Oh, Tristan's, yeah. Oh, very good, yeah. <laughs> I, well, you know, and one thing I was gonna say that I mentioned as we were waiting for the panel to begin is I've, one was my daughter, but another one was my niece, both recently said they took TikTok off their phones because they couldn't, they're both applying, they were applying to college, they just couldn't concentrate. And I was like, it was so exciting to hear just two people in one week say that, like maybe everyone's gonna really realize how much it's eating up their time um, and their brain. Um, yeah. Yeah. And may I, may I just say like real quick, because I think this has been a fascinating um, thing, you know, that that science that we know is called persuasive design, or maybe more appropriately called manipulative design. And mm -hmm. so I think it is so important, um, you know, and for so long, for decades, even, you know, we at the American Academy of Pediatrics have sort of focused on parents and kids, uh, you know, as saying here, here are rules that you need to set um, without focusing as much on the responsibility of technology companies and even our elected officials to set laws and enforce them appropriately and so one of the things that you know we've been doing um, over the last year especially um, has really been speaking to our elected officials to point out some of the loopholes in these laws and to push for stronger laws in the United States that will protect children from you know this opt uh, opt uh, in culture where you know right now they're everything is just sort of set at the lowest uh, possible level for privacy and and other things and so Richard we've had to talk about this earlier yeah. um, but but so important again to go back to the systems um, to really help protect protect and sustain kids as we we go through a difficult period well there's been so much wisdom and insight pouring from you all um, that i think we could probably spend a whole day conference just on on, on this <laughs> issue but we're we're gonna um go back to the audience now just for some q a um be, before we close um but also i think a number of you have been engaged with the poll um and I don't know whether we're able to share that visually, but um, the question, what is the biggest challenge families have faced during the pandemic? Um, well, the, most people have responded to the question, of, oh, sorry, the issue of managing screen time balance. So very much in keeping with what you've all been saying there with almost 50% of people voting, um, really thinking managing that screen life balance being a, a key issue uh, adapting to distance learning um the the second one with almost 27 percent um and then finally maintaining uh relationships virtually again just over 25 percent so i am guessing people can still vote uh for that and and at some point um the uh results can be shared more widely but here's um a, a couple of questions coming through. The first one, um, Nasheen, I think this is, is for you, is when you're, you're then trying to assess someone's use of technology, someone who's visiting you in the clinic, mm -hmm. what questions do you ask? Because it's such a sort of complex world now, isn't it, of tablets mm -hmm. and smartphones and games, consoles and so on. How, mm -hmm. how do you try and capture that? That's from Jennifer Joy Madden. Yeah, 
Oh, well, that's a very good question. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, you know, it's interesting because most pediatricians have about 15 minutes to do a full well child check. And so as much as we want to take a detailed media history, we we tend to have to prioritize. You know, I do have patients who, like I, I address, um, you know, and we don't even really call it screen time anymore. We call it device use um, with yep. patients. I address that at, uh, you know, at each well child visit and certainly other visits where, um, where it seems like, you know, things are happening. I think the most important thing is to really understand number one the content of of the material that they are consuming um, and number two to think about uh, the intention behind it like are they using it to to compare themselves to others or, or are they using it as a way to just sort of keep up with what's happening in the world um, and number three you know what effect is it having on on their daily life is it cutting into their sleep is it affecting their schoolwork is it affecting their mood so so I think like you know in in a limited time frame with with physicians and clinicians everywhere. Um, you know, if, if you had to focus on three things, those are the three things that I think are, are the most important and the most, um, and the most useful to kind of get to, to what you need to. But I, but I also have to say during the pandemic, you know, again, knowing that um, these devices and apps and everything are really designed to just keep people clicking, I've put much less emphasis on the amount of time and just sort of said, you know, as, as long as we can have a balance, as long as it's not, you know, cutting into, you know, healthier parts of your life, let's, you know, also be sure to give ourselves a break because sometimes we need, we need a little bit, uh, a, a little bit of grace. <laughs> Can I add to that, uh, please? Sure. Um, because my dear colleague, Devorah Heitner, I think has a wonderful way of approaching this. And I found it really helpful for young people is she puts them into of how we approach this into three buckets of technology and social media. One is consumption. The next is connection. And the next is creation. So what are you using it for? Are you creating something? So are you doing something super awesomely cool and like going, and then like you wanna spend six hours on creating some wonderful thing or program or design or art, whatever, that is very different than scrolling through Instagram yeah, and yeah. Hit people and you know, that kind of stuff. Or are you doing connect, are you, do you have a meaningful connection with someone? So I have yeah. found that just separating those into those three buckets and then approaching young people about, so how do we want to then do that the way machine's talking is incredibly helpful for young people um, and that they can think about it in a very different way. Yeah, yeah, it makes, makes huge sense. And, and, and Tiffany, from your perspective, you know, with your sort of structured time in a sense, in terms of looking forward to getting through to Saturday to take a break, I mean, are there sort of, I mean, are rest breaks in the use of tech a good way of indicating how somebody's relating to it? Yeah, I mean, I the thing I struggle with, like I'm sure so many parents, is the dailiness. Like I almost found find it so much easier on texture box. It's not a discussion. Finally, one day we're not frigging talking about <laughs> time to get off your screen. We're going outside. I mean, it's just like <clears throat> it's so exhausting. I just want to speak to every parent and educator out there and say, like, if we could have a primal scream on the issues around how, like, in the <laughs> daily week, it is so exhausting. Um, and I do think about when I was a kid, my parents were divorced, my mom went back to work, I was home alone a lot. And I watched a lot of Brady Bunch and Three's Company and mindless television until my mom got home. And I really have to remind myself that I, I'm okay, you know, however, it is a different ball game when it's like, I couldn't drag the TV that was in my kitchen into bed with me. And I think getting the screens out of the bedroom is the number one thing. How you, if, however you can approach it, I've shown research on like sleep in grades or, you know, yeah. I, what every kid is different on how you're going to get that battle. But you know, we have a certain time at night, the screens must go downstairs. And I just, I cannot like sleep as, you know, it is the invention of the light bulb change sleep. And then the technology is like, and we're going to keep you up and stimulated <laughs> forever. And you're never going to have a good night's yeah. sleep. Or you're going to wake up and the whole world's going to come at you on what you missed or something that happened. And that's before you've even woken up. So I think, um, you know, I think really having clarity around that boundary is super key. And then I love the uh, divorce. I love that creation, consumption, connection. And those are really good to think about. Like my daughter was on her screen last night, but then I heard her giggling with a friend and I was like, that's cool. 
you know, like, what is she doing on there? I mean, and really, uh, and, and helping them understand that difference. Um, and even myself, like there's times I need to zone out and scroll and I've had an intense day. I'm just like, I don't read the New York times or whatever it is. So being honest that all of, you know, what I try to, we try to teach our kids is every day is going to have some good things happen. Some bad things happen. You're going to be focused. You're going to need to zone out. You're going to need to be in nature. Like they need all of these, all of these parts, just as your plate needs all the different kinds of foods and nutrients and, and really helping um, ourselves because we're modeling behavior for our kids do the same things that we're talking about is really important too. Thank you. Well, we're pretty much out of time. I'm sorry to say, I, I really do think this could have gone on because I really wanted to talk about digital poverty and what it was like for those who struggled to get that online connection during COVID and how, and you mentioned loneliness, um, Rosalind, just how distressing it was for so many who didn't have the data, didn't have the devices and so on to, to keep those connections. Yeah. But I just want to, to thank you all for really such a rich and informative panel um, and how much keeping in mind joy and happiness, as well as notions like resilience and, and having a, a very compassionate perspective on that. So we're not expecting people to cope with everything and uh, indefinitely. So thank you, Nasheen. Thank you, Rosalind. And thank you, Tiffany. And I'm sure people will be reaching out to you in their own ways after this session to, I hope, continue the conversation of this incredibly important area. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. you for Thank you so much. And thank you both.